this is our podcast. It's Creatures of the Night, and I'm Chris. And I'm Wendy. You can't see me, but I'm dancing. <laughs> no, you can't see us, but she is dancing. She's getting the party started. But guess what, Wendy? What? This is our 50th podcast. You are lying. No, ma'am, I am not. This is the 50th episode. That's why I have this calendar right next to me. <laughs> What's that? Our golden anniversary? <laughs> Oh, shit. I don't don't get me started on that. I don't know how that works. So, oh, do I owe you a pearl? Is that what you're asking? I think you owe me gold. I'm pretty oh, sure gold. that's gold. But what's a diamond anniversary then? Hmm. It's gotta be like 100, right? 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> if people are making it to that, then fuck. <laughs> they're vampires. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And we will be podcasting about them. <laughs> or they're ghosts. Well, Still then they're together. not really making it technically. Well, Do they even remember? They stay together. Like penguins. <laughs> yeah. They mate for life. Yes. I didn't know that about ghosts, but it's nice to know that they do that as well. Now That's, I'm, I'm very... According to my research, it's true. <laughs> I, like, I like how you're checking your notes right now. Yes. There's no I've paper or pen next to me. <laughs> <laughs> you're the really professional one that does that. I'm just like, ha, 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 this is silly. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, that's the magic of podcasting. Nobody can actually see what you're doing there. It just looks like you're about to type something up or scribble a note on something. <laughs> I'm just doing that for you, making you think I'm paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pumped uh, that we've made it 50 episodes in. You know, when we first started this, we were just kind of playing around and doing our own thing. And I guess uh, we still are. But now we have <laughs> lots of people <laughs> that are joining and listening us every week. So how cool is that? It is so cool. And we really appreciate those people that are tuning in and listening and hopefully enjoying it or finding some kind of value in this. And you guys can tell us, you know, you can always rate and review. I know it takes a little bit of time, but you can always send a message or something. Tell us you suck. Get to the point. (laughs) Whatever. Or you can be like, you you ladies, you're so funny. But yeah, you know what's so funny is just this morning, I think. Because I do all my thinking in the shower. As I'm getting out of the shower, I'm like, you know, it's so funny. When we first started this, we were like iffy about signing up for a whole year for a podcast host because we were like, we don't know how long we're truly going to be doing this. Yeah, You know, we wanted to get the free trial from some podcast hosts and do just like some a few episodes and see how it goes. And now here we are 50 episodes later. We're really doing this. We're committed. Right, right. Well, we've committed to at least 50. We'll see what the future holds. No, we've committed to the whole year. Because <laughs> that's what I paid for. <laughs> I like, I, you know, it's, well, that's true. Um, I like that the uh, best time to do any of the the thought process, I don't know why, is also for me while I'm in the shower. I get like my best thinking done in that heat of the water. I don't, I don't know. It opens up your pores and it opens up your mind. I really don't know why. <laughs> it really is so strange. I think of so many fucking things when I'm in the shower and then like yeah. as soon as I start doing regular life stuff I'm like what was that thing again <laughs> yes I have to text it to myself like immediately or I text Wendy you know and she's like this dream is crazy and I'm like what dream because I had already forgotten about it by the time she's responding I was like oh yeah I forgot I talked I talked to myself about that while I was in the shower I was like I gotta tell Wendy then I get out of the shower I can't do it while I'm in the shower because you know electronics and all but Best. <laughs> you gotta get yourself one of those waterproof phones or something well you know what back in the day when i used to take baths i would put my phone in like like a, a like gallon a sized freezer bag oh yeah <laughs> so i could watch netflix or whatever while i was in uh actually i was watching episodes of um this paranormal show that used to be on oh shit tlc paranormal lives or something like that so that's what i was watching and that's me (laughs) watching her paranormal shows while she's soaking in the tub but that's good times yeah no i mean i love to watch tv in the tub when i do actually lay in the tub and why not be something you enjoy no matter what it is well i wouldn't mind reading but then again pages they get all wet so i don't know I I see people with those fancy tubs with the fancy trays. You know, it's got like a nice wooden board, almost like a cutting board kind of a thing. And they've got a spot to wine and a spot to hold the book and all of this other stuff. I I don't even have room in my bathroom to hold this little cute board. Where would it go? (laughs) It doesn't even matter. I mean, you risk knocking that shit and having it fall. So I wouldn't do that. I I watch TV in the tub all the time. I must hate my phone because I don't put it in any plastic bag. (laughs) You don't put it in a plastic bag. (laughs) 
I guess I'm that that bitch is kind of old and already acting up and always telling me I don't have enough storage space. So I'm just kind of like, I can't wait to drop this shit in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> I just figured you're not nearly as clumsy as I am because I will I'll I'll drop it in the tub for sure. But speaking of sitting back and relaxing, it's funny that <laughs> we actually went there. I was actually doing that this week at some point. I was sitting back on my swing that I have out on the patio here, my itty bitty tiny little patio. I have a giant swing that takes up the entire patio, <laughs> which is fine. So what the hell else am I going to do with that itty bitty little space anyways? I don't have a bistro set. I'm not going to go out there and sip my fancy coffee on my little itty bitty bistro set. Well, no. That wouldn't even be comfortable though. Your, your swing be. is comfortable at least. It just doesn't yeah. allow for anybody else to come out there with you, which is like fine, right? <laughs> It's perfect. That's actually where I, I like to go to do my, my research work for uh, my podcasts or when I want to read a book or when I want to watch Netflix and drink some wine. I, I like to just go out there and swing on my swing. And that's what I was doing this week. I was uh, relaxing, compiling my research for my story. And, you know, <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes I'm actually squeezing in my research in between breakfast, lunch, dinner, and getting ready to go to work and all of those other things that happen in our lives. But there I was sitting back on my lime green rocking chair. <laughs> I guess that's the color it is. It's it's a bright, bright color. If anybody that's like passing by, they'll be like, damn, that's a loud ass swing. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm out there, the sun's setting, and these little bats that we have in the woods start flying around, and they're squeaking, and they're eating up all the bugs. I'm like, yes, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I found something that really confused the shit out of me and also intrigued me. Um, it was all at the same time. So it was like a what? Ooh, like I was like mixed emotions. I had to look into this some more. That was the Centralia Massacre. You ever heard of that? What? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that was your reaction. This was an incident that took place during the American Civil War in which 24 unarmed Union soldiers were captured and executed in Centralia, Missouri. I've never heard of that. Yeah, that was what I said, too. I'm like, hold on a second. What is this Centralia massacre? I only know about Centralia, Pennsylvania. And it's very possible that I had heard of this before and my brain just overwrote all of that information once I had learned about Centralia, Pennsylvania. And just in case you guys that are listening, you don't know what I'm talking about. Centralia, Pennsylvania is now a ghost town since the underground fire started many, many, many years ago. And guess what? That was all from my brain. I didn't have to Google that shit. <laughs> <laughs> But since I am going to spell out some facts here, that town only has a population of five now. Five peeps still live in the town where the streets are still smoking. Side note, Centralia, I have pictures of it on Instagram. Um, there's a lot of it that's off limits. You're not supposed to go into these places because since the underneath has been burning for many, many, many years, it's dangerous. The roads are collapsing in certain areas. It's a cool, creepy ghost town. And it's, I mean, I guess it just stays foggy all the time if the streets are constantly burning, right? So better for pictures. Oh, it was um, the, the original uh, Silent Hill. That's where they got the idea for Silent Hill. Oh, okay. Uh, talk about now? Like the more you talk about it, I'm like, wait, maybe I yeah. do know this story. Anyways, I had only known of that Centralia, so I had to dig into the Centralia Massacre as soon as I laid my excited eyes all over those <laughs> words, you know? And what I found out was really interesting. So, are you ready to hear my little tale? I am super ready. Well, good. I hope you know that any single, any time I say little to just disregard that word altogether. I don't even you know why I put that in long there. Long ass. Long, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm trying to trick myself into thinking, yeah, this is a little story. It's not. <laughs> so we got to go all the way back to the fall of 1864. This all begins with the Centralia Massacre. And like I said, there were 24 unarmed Union soldiers that were executed. This dastardly deed was carried out by the pro-Confederate guerrilla leader, William T. Anderson, otherwise known as Bloody Bill. And among these guerrillas was the soon-to-be outlaw known as Jesse James. Ooh. Oh. So let's go back to the fall of 1864. On September 23rd, Anderson engaged in a skirmish in Boone County, Missouri. Not to be confused with Boone's Farm Wines. That's actually in <laughs> California. <laughs> no, I've actually heard of Boone's County before, though. Yeah. But I've never heard of oh, this other town. I 
actually, I feel like this story kind of hits close to home for us. I feel like there's a lot of this you you will know. So just you, you'll see where I'm going with it. Just just stay in there with me. Hang tight. I'm with you. I'm like, <laughs> this is not to be rude either. I'm certain I have early signs of dementia because it's like I forget things so easily. And then as people start talking, I'm like, wait, maybe I do know this. <laughs> right. I do the same thing, but I don't think it's like dementia. I mean, I hope it's not. I just feel like my brain only has certain amount of space, like your phone. And it's like, okay, we don't have enough space for all of this. So I'll take a little bit more in, but this other stuff that you haven't even processed in a while, it's got to go. So it just takes that. It's gone. I'm sure your explanation is actually the correct thing of what's going on (laughs) here since I'm only like 36 years old. But since I had a psychic tell me once that I was going to lose my mind in my 80s, you know, I'm just kind of thinking that dementia is right around the corner. Right. right. But you have um, a a ways to go. Ways before 80s. All right. Well, uh, let me refresh your memory if any of this uh, is old news to you. Maybe it will all be new news to you, depending on that uh, state of dementia, hopefully (laughs) not. So anyways, where was I? His men managed to kill 11 federal soldiers and three black civilian teamsters. The federals responded the next day by shooting six of Anderson's men who were captured at a home in a town called Rocheport or Rocheport. I, Rocheport sounds fancier, so I'm going to go with Rocheport. <laughs> they, they probably wanted to pronounce it that way, too. I right? had a girl I went to school with that her last name was Roach, basically. Roach. So they're sisters. There were two of them. And the older one pronounced her name almost like French. You know, she changed yeah. it, basically, and put this, like, kind of French spin on it. And the youngest would be like, she's a dumb bitch. Our last <laughs> name is Roach. Roach. <laughs> <laughs> She'd call her out on it all the time. It was quite funny. <laughs> right, like Miss Bouquet or uh, whatever from um, what was that? Uh, making keeping up appearances. Do you yeah. remember that show? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bouquet. On that same day, Anderson attacked the pro-union town of Fayette, but the attack was a failure. Anderson lost 13 men, and more than 30 were wounded. Only one Union soldier had been killed, and two were wounded. For those of you who are keeping score. <laughs> At 9 a.m. on September 27th, Bloody Bill, with about 80 guerrillas, some dressed in stolen Union Army uniforms, moved into Centralia to cut across the North Missouri Railroad. The guerrillas looted the town and reportedly drank a lot of whiskey from stolen boots. Not just regular boots, stolen boots. Because I bet (laughs) the whiskey tasted so much better out of a stolen boot. Yeah. Wendy, go get a stolen boot right now and pour, pour your beverage. in it. <laughs> we, we have to know. What were they thinking? Was it like, because if they're stolen, they're kind of, um, I don't know, it's just, just the thrill of drinking yeah. out of it made it better? They're all like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they were like, my boots are way too sweaty from all this skirmishing. So let's go steal some boots off of some people who haven't been skirmishing. And maybe the whiskey won't taste as watered down Ugh, from sweat. Uh. Ew. Yeah. Anyways, Saucy. wipe that thought right out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anderson blocked the rail line and the engineer of an approaching train failed to realize it was an attack until it was too late. The guerrillas swarmed the train and the 125 passengers were divided between civilians and soldiers. A total of 23 Union soldiers were on board, all of which had been placed on leave after a battle of Atlanta and were fucking heading home. Mm. The Union soldiers were ordered at gunpoint to strip off their uniforms. Bloody Bill called for an officer, so the Sergeant Thomas Goodman bravely stepped forward, expecting to be shot while the other men would be spared. However, Bloody Bill's men ignored Goodman and started shooting the others. Their bodies were then mutilated and scalped. What the fuck? The guerrillas then set fire to the train and sent it running down the tracks toward Sturgeon, Missouri. They torched the depot and rode away from the town. Sergeant Goodman was taken prisoner on Bloody Bill's orders with the plan that he would be exchanged later for one of Bloody Bill's own men, whom was a prisoner being held by federal forces. Goodman spent 10 days in the captivity of the guerrillas before escaping at night as they prepared to cross over the Missouri River near Rocheport, Rocheport, which I don't remember. How did I say? Rocheport. (laughs) <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah they um they really wanted to send a signal here 
with this situation um, and everything that they did. It was pretty harsh. Yeah, that's they're not fucking around. No, that's either the that they wanted to send and that they're cold blooded as fuck. Yes. Seems yeah. a bit unnecessary, though. Mm-hmm. I agree. At about 3 p.m., Union Major A.V.E. Johnston with 146 men of the newly formed 39th Missouri Infantry Regiment, rode into Centralia. The townspeople warned him that Bloody Bill had at least 80 well-armed men, but Johnston nevertheless led his men in pursuit. The Union soldiers soon encountered the guerrillas, and Johnston decided to fight them on foot. He ordered his men to dismount and form the line of battle. He then reportedly called out a challenge. Anderson's men replied by making a mounted charge. Armed with muzzle-loaded Enfield rifles, the Federal recruits were no match for the guerrillas with their revolvers. Johnston's first volley killed several guerrillas, but then his men were overrun. Most were shot down as they attempted to flee. According to Frank James, his younger brother, Jesse, fired the shot that killed Major Johnston. Of the 147 Union soldiers, 123 were killed during the battle with only one man wounded. Confederate forces lost three men and 10 were wounded. Later on, Bloody Bill and his guerrillas were ambushed at Independence, Missouri. Several of them killed, including Bloody Bill, who was not only killed but also decapitated. <laughs> it's a lot of mutilations and decapitations going on these days. I am mean, like, is it just to make sure? Or are they trying to collect trophies? What the fuck is going on here? Oh, it was another statement. They had also, from what I read, like posted his head up for people to see. Like oh, and yes. Yeah. And they did decapitate him right away. They killed him and then they went back and they're like, you know what else we got to do? Yeah. They had a few drinks and thought about it. And they were yeah. like, this will be really good. We should do this. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds, I think that's what happened. I wonder if they stole more boots for those drinks, but I don't have that information. I just know that they, they came back after they killed him to take his head and put it out there for everyone to see. So Jesse James escaped Riding away, he was shot again by the troops, but managed to escape the attack by crawling away. So I need to pause here before I also crawl right off into what happened next so that I can tell you a little bit about what the paranormal groups in the area have reported. Per the Columbia Paranormal Research Society, a lady by the name of Holly McGee, owner and director, and Rebecca Ballou say that they've both heard several accounts of ghostly fallen soldiers at the battlefield. CPRS, and I don't know if they abbreviate it, but I did just to, <laughs> <laughs> decided to leave a recorder there overnight. And when they retrieved it in the morning, the audio was full of cannon fire and gunshots. And according to one report discovered by the team, an apparition of a man dressed in uniform has been seen there, and many think that he is a spirit of a fallen soldier. Which makes sense. Yeah. Right? I mean, I hope it's not to some guy wandering around <laughs> in a uniform, you know. Right. Just some other guy wandering around the park. Hey, no, I'm not a ghost. But he's in a Civil War uniform. I mean, because right. he said he, they, were, they described him as wearing one. Yeah. Like, maybe he's one of the ghosts. Yeah. I mean, I guess he would be. <laughs> I'm hoping. Hopefully. Uh, another paranormal group by the name of Elite Paranormal of Kansas City visited and researched the battlefield using a spirit box and loudspeaker, the Mel SB7. Their video is up on YouTube for anyone interested. As the team stood out in the open field, they immediately start speaking. Well, I, I don't know how long they actually were speaking before they edited to this part, but they say <laughs> hello and immediately get a response. And the response is, they hurt me. Aww. The team also asked if there was anyone there with them and received a yes and then Mike. And after additional words... They didn't even wait for them to ask no. <laughs> who. Like, yes, it's so I'm desperate here. for attention. It's like, oh, hi. Hi, hi Mike. Who are you? <laughs> yes. That's it was a just good like ghost. That. Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know, right? Those are the kind of ghosts that we often like wish to encounter, the ones that are just so ready to talk to us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, we don't we don't always get that lucky, but it seemed like this team was doing pretty good and I don't know, I don't know their backstory. I don't know if they'd been there a thousand times and and they're used to them, so they're comfortable and they're, you know, responding so well or what. But after additional words populate from the spirit box that 
to me didn't make a whole lot of sense this time. They were just words coming through. Mm -hmm. They got the sentence and it was captain. They took him. And it's so weird because you, you know how the spirit box works. It's sh- 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 word, sh- 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 word, but they received that as a sentence. And they also got, don't have to hurt me. So I thought that those things were a little odd and interesting because of how they actually somewhat relate to what had happened there. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And I mean, that thing goes so fast that yeah. you don't get sentences like that, you know, right. often. At the most, you might get like maybe three words that like happen to piece together and sound like a sentence, but it's going to be like, you know, you got bad credit or something like that. Yeah. It's, I guess it's going to be from a commercial or something. Yeah. It's not going to be, you know, they hurt me or right. something like that. I know. A lot of times we get really excited because we'll get like a yes or a no or a name. But I never hear like, you know, I like the uh, you don't have credit or, or contact this yeah. lawyer or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but you do hear those like uh, commercials kind of bleeding through and it didn't sound that way on their uh, recording. So I don't know. It, it was interesting, I thought. So um, now I'm going to go back to my story, but I'm going to backtrack just a little bit because I want to talk about Jesse James. And back when he was just a boy, his father was a Baptist minister who wanted his boys to be well-educated, but he ended up passing away during a trip to the California gold fields. And that basically left Jesse James without a father, and he was only three years old. His mother, Zarelda. Speaking of spicy names. Oh my God, I love that. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh, she's a gypsy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> she lived on the farm for the rest of her life through three marriages and eight children. Damn. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Jesse was only 16 years old when he and his older brother Frank became Confederate guerrilla soldiers. Riding with William Quantrell and Mr. Notorious himself, Bloody Bill Anderson. 16 years old. Yeah, a bit at that time, I mean, those were men, you know? Right. Like, yeah, go and get a job. Marry a woman. I don't know. Zerelda with her eight kids, she's like, go. Bye-bye. Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, at 14, she was probably like, are you ever going to leave? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> we got other mouths to feed around here. Go out and do something. Yeah. Uh, so at the end of the Civil War, the James brothers, uh, Jesse and Frank, were now officially outlaws. From 1860 to 1882, the James gang was responsible for, for 20 bank and train robberies. They also murdered countless individuals that stood in their way. They stole an estimated $200,000. <laughs> I know it's like to me that's like well that sucks but I'm sure back in the day 200,000 was a I whole know. lot of money <laughs> I think it's supposed to be a lot of money yeah I'm guessing in 1880 that was probably a shit ton of money despite their ruthlessness they became full heroes though they were not said to be the Robin Hoods of their time and that's because these dudes kept all the money that they stole in 1869 the gang robbed a bank in Gallatin Missouri Jesse shot the banker through the heart, feeling he was responsible for the callous murder of Bloody Bill Anderson. The James gang lost some public favor after this, and then local newspapers started to call for the capture of the now bloodthirsty gang. Yeah, why do people like Jesse James so much? I know that he liked his children, from what I read. Um, He was a good father. He was a family man. Yes. So what? Simply man. because he uses the justification, well, I'm robbing banks and I'm robbing trains, but it's only to feed my family. And people are like, so. oh, I get it. That's cool. Yeah. People really liked him. I don't know. Was he attractive? I mean, must have been Brad Pitt played him in that's the That's what I was going to say. Oh. I mean, in the movie, obviously, mm-hmm. he's Brad Pitt. So, so it's had like, to be. if Jesse James <laughs> looked like Brad Pitt, then I think, yeah, I would be on that. I'd right. be on that for real. But I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> even old Brad Pitt now. Like, oh, 100%. Probably more so than young. Nope, never mind. I just thought about it. a river runs through it. So, yeah, no, on it. Anyways. Fight Club. Oh, that's <laughs> so many good movies. He's a damn good actor. He really is. Are you going to for- see that uh, new Quentin Tarantino movie? Yes. Like, I want to see it. It's out, right? Yeah, it's out. Yeah, I might see it tomorrow. (laughs) I really want to see that movie. I was like, oh, so excited when I first saw the preview. 
And then, like, right after that, all that shit about the Manson murder house or whatever just happened, um, you know, where Zach Bagans bought one up. Right. I know it's not the same one, but it's all, like, so... Like, boom, 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 like in your face. And I'm reading Helter Skelter, too, by the way. So I'm like, ah, I can't get enough of this shit. <laughs> That's crazy. That's yeah. a lot of crazy coincidence. Yeah, I wonder if they put that mansion up for sale just because of the movie coming out. They were like, I bet we can get top dollar right now. <laughs> and Zach Megan's is like, how much do you need? <laughs> I've got it. I want to own this. So let's go. But yeah, I just wonder why people loved him so much. It's got to be the look. I'm with you there. Yeah. I don't I mean, know. You know, people like Wyatt Earp and stuff like that. A lot of people want to call him like a hero and everything. And then there's a lot of stories about what a dickhead he was. And then he was a pretty ruthless motherfucker. But he was a lawman, at least. At least he had that going for him. At times, yeah. he was a lawman. Yeah. I have to assume that just from what I've read, people knew him as a child. You know, he was local. I think feel like they loved him because he was a family man. They felt like he wasn't just robbing just for himself or whatever he was, like you said, giving it back to his family. And I don't know, maybe he was cool. Maybe he, you know, pulled some favors for some folks every now and then. Maybe he'd go and milk some cows or I, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but okay, so maybe like like a mobster type guy, if you think about or whatever, yeah. real, real respectable. Yeah. And they've yes. got their they've got their morals, but they're also going to rob people and kill them. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess that I guess that makes sense. I, I, I'll buy that. I think that that's kind of kind of the mindset. Local okay. mobster, 1800s. So frustrated at how the locals protected them. Governor Crittenden had the railroad place an enormous price on the James brothers heads. Pinkerton detectives hired by several bankers raided the James's farm in 1875, thinking that the older brothers were there. They threw a bomb in the window, which killed Jesse and Frank's younger half-brother, Archie, as their mother watched. Oh, she, she got lost- like seven others, though. Six others. <laughs> <laughs> She's got spares. So, but, uh, but she lost her like part of her right arm and her hand during the struggle. So I think she's, but by the way that it described that, I think that she went without both hands. They're both gone. If she lost part of her right arm and hand unless it's just like it took part of her right arm and then the whole hand i don't know it took a chunk out of it i don't know that is really sad though i didn't mean to be like rude no 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 seeing your that happened to your child it's yeah nobody ever wants that to happen but i mean i get it this is long time ago and shit like this happened i mean he kind of put his family in that situation by being who he was so it's yeah, I mean, like, it's not to be, like, oh, my God, that's shocking. How horrible it happened. Yeah. I mean, he was an outlaw. So Yeah, right, exactly. In 1882, the brothers planned one last robbery with Charlie and Bob Ford. They were unaware of the fact that these brothers intended to betray them for the reward money. On the morning of the planned robbery, Jesse ate breakfast with the Fords. He then placed his gun on one of the farmhouse beds and stopped to straighten a picture that had hung on the wall. Bob Ford shot Jesse in the back of his head. Jesse James died instantly and was buried in the side yard of the James's farmhouse. His remains were later moved to the family plot in Mount Olivet Cemetery in Kearney, Missouri. The locals were not the slightest bit happy with what the Ford brothers did. Bob Ford, who was pardoned by Governor Crittenden, was driven out of Missouri, known as the coward who had shot Jesse James, in case you hadn't seen that movie. Right. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> Sam Rockwell, right? Yes, that, it is. Yeah. My man. Ironically, he ended up traveling around in a Wild West show, which was all about the James gang. <laughs> That's a little backwards, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that messed up? Bob Ford was shot and killed in Creed, Colorado in 1892. His older brother, Charlie, stayed in Missouri but was shunned. He ended up committing suicide 10 years after his brother was murdered. Hmm. Frank James gave himself up after Jesse was killed. He was tried several times, but there was never enough evidence to convict him. He lived peacefully for the rest of his life at the farm. In later years, he charged tourists to give them a tour of the farm. I even read that for a little extra, he would sell pebbles off of Jesse's grave. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's like, fuck it, he don't need them. <laughs> now, the James Farm and House has been considered haunted for over 100 years. Located 
off James Road in Kearney, Missouri, the farm is now a museum. And the employees at the farm have reported very strange occurrences. After the museum closes for the night, many people have spotted lights going on and off in the farmhouse. Other reports involve doors that have slammed shut in front of them without any cause. Like they're saying that there's no wind or any other reason why that might be happening. Several witnesses have reported hearing horse hooves stomping outside on foggy nights. Ooh, Ooh, I know. We were just talking about fog. And when they go to investigate, nothing is ever found. Now, the funny thing is, I've read a couple of occurrences that seem to suggest that the activity increases on the nights with heavier fog. I don't really know why or have any additional explanation other than it's surely 100% creepier that way. (laughs) (laughs) They report hearing whispered conversations inside the house when no one is there. Again, foggy nights. But my favorite report is that many have claimed to have heard the sound of a bomb going off or cries and gunshots as if a battle is happening right outside. Mm. That's that. Help me out. I can never remember this word. (laughs) Residual. Thank you. God, why can't I? Well, that's not the type of haunting I'm going to be, apparently, since I can't even remember what it's called. (laughs) That's good, though, because you want to interact with other people. Yeah. I'd be like, you didn't believe in ghosts? How about now? (laughs) Also, if you were residual ghosts, then, like, we couldn't find each other if we're both ghosts, right? Like, you would just keep doing your same thing. I'd be like, hello, I'm right here. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And I would still be just saying the same old story that you already heard. (laughs) And she just keeps replaying it over and over. Of course, if I get my dementia, then I'll just be like, really? Oh, no. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> the best never... story I've ever heard. <laughs> this is such a good story. I'll see There's you tomorrow dementia goes. for the same story. <laughs> <laughs> when I when you do see me, you'll be like, wow, I haven't seen you in forever. <laughs> Many staff at the museum today will not even go into the house alone. They state that they feel an unnatural, intense presence in the home, and it scares them. So, Jesse James was shot to death in Missouri by Robert Ford on April 3rd, 1882, which ended the life of one of post-Civil War America's most famous outlaws. But this is where the history turns into a conspiracy story and ended up selling lots of tickets to a roadside attraction in Missouri. According to a man named J. Frank Dalton, Jesse James actually faked his death in 1882. And in 1949... He was still alive and well and living at none other than the Miramac Caverns in Missouri. Well, oh. what? Oh, because I've been to the Miramac. Uh, yes. Yeah, I've been there. So I do know this story. Okay. Well, Mr. Know-it-all, J. Frank Dalton, claimed that this was the truth because he was actually claiming to be the famous outlaw, Jesse James. The story of J. Frank Dalton is also known as the man who would be Jesse James. And it might be one of the weirdest stories ever told about Route 66. But in order for me to tell you this story, I first have to tell you the story about Merrimack Caverns. The cave was commercially developed in the 1930s by Lester B. Dill, a Missouri farm boy who coined the phrase, I have put more people underground and brought them out alive more than anyone else. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. He's Lester. hilarious. <laughs> I bet he loved to tell that joke to everyone. <laughs> I got a real knee slapper for you. Wait till you hear this one. Exactly. And they're like, <laughs> all right. That's all right, enough. Lester. <laughs> I got it. So Lester Dill was born in 1898, and he was only six years old when his father, Thomas Benton Dill, ventured into Fisher's Cave across the Miramac from the family farm for the first time. By the time he was 10, Lester was taking tourists from St. Louis on guided cave tours using only a kerosene lamp. Horrifying. (laughs) (laughs) I would trust my 10-year-old in a cave with a kerosene lantern with some strangers. Goodbye. Oh, my God. I guess I was just imagining that the guide has the lamp and nobody else. But you're right. I guess everybody might have had a lamp. <laughs> I would. Yeah, that's true. I hope they did. It didn't didn't spell out that fact for me. So we'll, we'll just pretend that everybody had lanterns. Over the years, Dill continued to explore the many caves of the Merrimack Valley. And in 1928, Lester signed a contract with the state and launched his very own cave guiding business, complete with souvenirs and homemade food. 
a few years later, when the state contract expired and the country was in the midst of the Great Depression, Lester began searching for his own cave to develop. He finally decided to lease Salt Peter Cave, which was just a few miles downstream from the park. Side note, the Spaniard Hernando de Soto was said to have discovered the cave in 1542. And during the 1800s, the cave was used by saltpeter miners for storage and shelter, and legend has it that escaped slaves were sheltered there as they made their way to safety in the northern states. There were also stories that outlaws, including the famous Jesse James gang, had found refuge in the cave and may have even left some of their ill-gotten gains hidden somewhere inside. Treasure. Treasure. <laughs> Ghostly Treasure. The legends of the cave were important to Lester, but even more important was the cave's proximity to Route 66, America's most traveled highway. Dill knew that if he got the word out that the tourists would be beating a path to his doorway. He bought this cave and renamed the new attraction Miramac Caverns and finally hired a local sawmill crew to construct a road to the cave. Miramac Caverns opened officially on Memorial Day in 1933, and for the first three years of the cave's operation, the entire Dill family, including the children, worked day and night. They even lived in a tent at the site. Visitors that managed to make it to the cave always left with a Merrimack Cavern sign tied to their bumpers. <laughs> <laughs> this man, he has some intense marketing going oh, yeah. on. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. There was a whole lot that I actually cut out because I'm like, I just can't. <laughs> He's this so dude. proud of himself. It must have been amazing in those times, like when these things were available, that all of a sudden it became a business to like... I'm going to go buy a cave and yes. then all I have to do is get somebody to walk some people down there and ooh and ah and tell them what a stalagmite and a stalactite is. And I get to charge them like at least, I mean, these days it's probably, well, fuck, Kirshner Caverns is like $30 a ticket or something like uh, that. And they're expensive. They can charge well, at least like $10 a head. And man. all they did was buy a hole in the ground. Right, exactly. It's funny that you brought that up because when this cave opened up in 1933, he was charging 40 cents a ticket. <laughs> I thought you were about to say $40. I was like, no, what? Back in the day, that was expensive. I wish. I know. I mean, that's like three months' salary. <laughs> <laughs> so inflation, yeah, because now it's 30 bucks to go and right. visit a cave. But uh, he ended up hiring school children to attach the signs to bumpers of each and every automobile that stopped at the cave. <laughs> <laughs> so child labor as well. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Good times. <laughs> good times. Later, the job became easier when adhesive was developed for the backs of the bumper signs. <laughs> Called God. bumper stickers. Then. I hope so. I, when it, it still said bumper sign, so I and I wonder how heavy these pieces of wood were that they're like <laughs> slapping onto the backs of your car. <laughs> How long would that stay on? Would you be driving down Route 66 and just see a whole bunch of boards in the road? Right. <laughs> like, they just fell off. Like if you're doing right. a cross-country situation, it drops off and, you know, right, New exactly. Mexico somewhere. <laughs> I really hope they were bumper stickers at this point. It just said bumper signs. In 1940, while he was exploring an unknown part of the cave, Lester found some rusted guns and an old chest – which he claimed had belonged to none other than Jesse James. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> I just love they probably like really belong to, you know, like a half ass, you know, robber or whatever. Right, right, right. I don't know. And he just hung out and down in this cave where he was probably like making whiskey or something like that. Right. And he's like, nope, these are Jesse James. Right. Bump that ticket up. <laughs> now it's 60 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you said 60. I was going to say, now it's 45 cents. <laughs> Immediately, the words Jesse James's hideout was added to those bumper stickers. Because, <laughs> like I said, entrepreneur. Oh, he's a genius. Oh, yeah, for sure. Buy a cave, find some guns, and tie an outlaw to what it. Maybe got those boom. guns from an antique store. They weren't even like... <laughs> I honestly... I don't, I don't think I would put it past this guy because he was in it to win it. This dude was just like, let's print some dollar bills. What do I need to do? If I owned a hole in the ground, I think <laughs> I'd be like finding me some fake dinosaur bones or something. You know? <laughs> Got to make it juicy, man. Got to make it juicy. Well, that's, I, I don't know. So 
you, you'll you'll see some more about that as we go along. Okay. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I know, right? Like I said, conspiracy theories here. So, <laughs> during World War II, when gas rationing hit, Lester went down Route 66 to Fort Leonard Wood, a large basic training camp, and convinced the army to convoy troops to the cave for maneuvers. Hundreds of soldiers camped at the river bottom and marched into the cave in full battle dress. Every night, Lester threw dances for the soldiers in the cave and gave special rates to anyone in uniform. (laughs) Now, Francina, one of Lester and Mary's daughters, married one of the soldiers. His name was Rudy Torelli. After the war ended, Rudy became the general manager of the cave and handled most of the promotion and publicity. It was Torelli who discovered the man named J. Frank Dalton in 1949, who raised eyebrows by declaring that he was actually Jesse James. There is no question that Jesse James was one of the most famous outlaws in history. He, his brother, and their gang of cousins and friends wreaked havoc with banks and trains all over the Midwest. He remains an intriguing man, portrayed as both a cold-blooded killer by Pinkerton detectives and a Robin Hood rebel by friends and neighbors, becoming a legend over the years. It's little wonder that the grave itself had trouble keeping Jesse James in it, and apparently (laughs) Jesse's advertised death was just too mundane for his admirers to accept. So in 1902, Jesse's body was actually exhumed and reburied to make sure that it was safe. Less than five decades later, nearly a dozen old men came out of the woodwork each of them calling the corpse a counterfeit and each claiming to be the authentic Jesse James. What the fuck? I know. Everybody wants a piece of it. Everybody. One by one, they were all found to be frauds. But one of them managed to capture the attention of Rudy Torelli. Oh, and Lester Dell, of course, because he's still in the story. Rudy had been fascinated by the legend of Jesse James for more than 20 years. When all of the old men came forward claiming to be Jesse, he discredited all of them. All except for J. Frank Dalton. Mira McCaverns also already had a huge investment in Jesse James. They had been promoting the cave as Jesse James's hideout for a number of years, and the discovery of a strong box that had been taken during a James train robbery turned up in an uncharted section of the cave seemed to offer some validity to the story. If Jesse was still alive, Rudy and Lester were very determined to find him. Rudy traveled to Oklahoma to meet Dalton and became intrigued by what he found. The bedridden old man who claimed to be Jesse James was winning over all the skeptics. The press was starting to put its confidence into print, and no interviewer seemed to be able to poke a hole in this man's story. Most interesting of all, the self-proclaimed outlaw had a reason why he'd been silent for so long. Dalton claimed that Robert Ford had actually shot Charles Bigelow another Jesse James gang member in 1882. Bigelow's brains were blown out and he was buried under Jesse's name so that the real outlaw, Dalton, could live in peace. According to Dalton, the Missouri governor had also been in on the whole thing. What was his name? Critton- Crittenton? I-, I didn't put that there, but I think it was Crittenton. Yeah, because there's a county. Oh, okay. That's yeah, right. name, Crittenton county. county. They have a lot of tornado warnings. That's how yeah. I know that <laughs> county. You know that's so funny. You say that the whole time I'm doing this story in Missouri, that's exactly what I'm thinking about is fucking tornadoes. So maybe that's why. Dalton and the rest of the gang had made a pact to disclose their true identities only after they reached the ripe old age of 100. Rudy, still skeptical, examined Dalton with a magnifying glass and was stunned to discover damage done to the old man's body agreed with reports or injuries sustained by Jesse James. From a mutilated tip on the left hand index finger to evidence of severe burns on both feet, a dropping right eyelid, and bullet scars along the left shoulder, hairline, and abdomen. If Dalton wasn't Jesse James, he'd pretty much groomed himself from head to toe, leaving out nothing to make himself appear that he was him. Rudy began making arrangements to bring Dalton to Missouri. That's crazy. Like, mm-hmm. so I don't trust Rudy. Because right, exactly. He, he's got Lester telling him how to make a business successful, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. 
But that that would be nutty if you were like meeting with somebody at that age and they've got scarring in the same areas. It's like, okay, they they could have been a soldier as well, but how freaky to have the exact same injuries and the number of injuries and everything because you didn't do that to yourself just so you can pass it off right. as you being yeah. Jesse James because it, you would ha- it would age is what I'm saying. So right. he would have had to yeah. done it a long time ago long with this ago. plan that he's going to yeah. be telling people he's Jesse James <laughs> 20 years from now or something. I don't know. That's kind of wild. But also Rudy could be fucking lying. <laughs> well, so you can kind of see if, if the guy was legit, why he was so like intrigued by this man. Because like you said, these would have been aged injuries and it's not like he would have known 20 years prior that he needed to have that injury now so that 20 years later he would have to go around saying, hey, I'm just James. But with that said, yes, he is running around now with Lester Dill and Lester Dill is an entrepreneur and and they're looking for a reason to make their place even more successful. So instead of going to look at this guy and look for reasons why he's not Jesse James. They might have only been looking for reasons to prove that he was Jesse James. So that could be that imbalance. You know, like, you know what they say, if 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 something's too good to be true, you know, you got to look at it from both angles. And I don't know necessarily if he did. But then again, it says that he disproved several other old guys, you know, that came through as saying that they were Jesse James. So discredited them. I don't know. This guy was convincing enough for the purposes of the story that he decided to bring him home. Right. Uh, to Missouri. I don't, I don't actually know if that's uh, his I'm home. almost believing it. So <laughs> at this point, right? if I lived in this time, I'd be like, that is crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. So here's something else that's interesting. In planning a birthday celebration for the man that he now believed to be the legendary outlaw, Dalton told Rudy to try and track down some of the other living members of the gang. So Rudy found John Trammell. Rudy told the man that Jesse James wanted him to come to Merrimack Caverns for his 102nd birthday party. But Trammell swore that he didn't know the man. When Rudy went back to Dalton for an explanation, he was told that since he didn't know a secret password, Trammell wouldn't talk to him. When asked why he didn't offer the password to begin with, Dalton said that he wanted to make sure Rudy could be trusted. Dalton gave the password to him, and this time when he returned to Trammell, the old man agreed to come to the party. See? I mean, I'm like... That's wicked, right? I mean, unless the password was, get your ass here, I'm going to shoot you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or like, I'm going to pay you $5,000. Right. <laughs> right. Here's a cup of hund. You come into this party, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have the, I don't know what the secret password was either. But I just know that the old man got there and partied down. Yeah, there's cash in it for you. Cash. The secret password. <laughs> <laughs> Dalton was given a cabin on the Miramette Caverns property where he could live. He drank heavily and gained an abiding hatred for reporters. He was friendly with everyone else, though, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Dalton asked for a six-shooter and would actually shoot holes in the ceiling of his cabin to scare away any reporters. Rudy and Lester became concerned that he might actually kill somebody. So they started taking the powder out of the bullets and replacing the lead. This plan didn't work out so well, though, because Dalton could tell that the bullets weren't right based on how they weighed in his hand. So he demanded a full load. I'm assuming he got it because that's all I've got. (laughs) Wait. (laughs) It just stops there. No, no, no. I have more okay. stuff, but that's all I've got on the bullets. <laughs> okay. He didn't, he didn't actually kill anybody. <laughs> they were like, okay, here's your bullets. And then like somebody got shot. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I really don't know. I just know that he demanded a full load. So either he got him or he didn't. While Dalton was busy fending off reporters, Rudy was working hard to secure Dalton's legitimacy. Over the years, his faith in Dalton led him to appearing on What's My Line and The Tonight Show. Rudy appeared in newspapers and in men's magazines where he offered $10,000 to anyone who could prove that Dalton was a fraud. The story brought so much publicity to Miramac Caverns that Rudy created his own tribute to Dalton in the form of the very creepy Jesse James Wax Museum in Stanton. Now, you know how I feel about wax museums right (laughs) 
Are you saying very creepy because I couldn't handle it or it is just fucking creepy in there? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You're just on the same page with me that all wax museums yeah. are creepy. I mean, you gotta, there's, there is a certain, it doesn't creep me out to the fact that it, it's that fear of wax figures or, or whatever, but it's a, it's a, a thing that was carved to look somewhat similar to a living person at one point in time. The eyes aren't exactly right. The smile isn't exactly right. <laughs> it's some weird misshapen thing and you pay money to go and see it. I don't know. It's a weird. It's almost as if you paid money to see a corpse. It's that uh, there it is. All right, yeah, let's go. You know, it. At least with a corpse, you know that it was once a person. With a wax figure, it's like somebody spent time chiseling away to make it kind of resemble what they thought this person. So, I don't know. It, it's creepy in that sense. I don't know if if it's like creepy. Just saying. As somebody who's scared of them, I have a biased opinion. I hate them all. <laughs> but yes, it is fucking weird that people can sell tickets for somebody to go through a museum. Why is it a museum? I agree with you. The fact that people can make a living off of, I mean, this is worse than the hole in the ground. At least holes in the ground, the caves are actually kind of, they can be beautiful. Sometimes there's waterfalls down there, stalactites and all that. They're really pretty. But somebody pays to go in to see molds of people. Yeah. Why are people into this? And I demand to put a stop to it. So <laughs> I'm starting a petition on our Facebook page, I guess. That's the only place yeah. you could probably do it. Maybe Twitter. Like, it's let's weird. get together and stop this. I read something not too long ago about how people need to stop taking pictures with actors and actresses in these wax museums just so that basically they're just doing it so they could show it off to like their grandkids. Like, hey, I, I got a picture with so-and-so just to like, you know, for that. Oh, and, you know, then you tell them later on it was actually a wax museum. But that initial shock, I guess, that's what they're all paying money to get, you know, hey, look at me and Dolly Parton. See, we were tight. BFF, <laughs> me and Dolly. <laughs> That's so. dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I am just terrified of them. So maybe I just have a biased opinion. It's, it's understood. Today, the museum still stands. And inside, you will find the life-sized figures of Dalton and Rudy Torelli, as well as firearms that purportedly belong to the James gang and antiques like the Frank James bathtub. And a barber chair, which Jesse received his last trim. I don't know. This guy just collected everything he could get. Right. He just went to antique stores and picked them up <laughs> and then said that that's what they were. Yep. This was a bathtub the kid used to take a bath in. But here's the interesting stuff. There are autopsy pictures on display and a computer-enhanced projection that turns a 34-year-old Jesse James into an elderly J. Frank Dalton. Plus a study in 12-inch ears that allegedly proves that the lobes of Dalton and Jesse James were a perfect match. <laughs> My favorite part. That's, they, mm. <laughs> <laughs> How about just DNA? Like, yeah. oh. I know it was like before that, right? It was before that time people wouldn't, what year is this? It was in the 50s, basically. 49-ish is where we are, 49, 50s. Yeah, so I have no idea if that science is is there, but it's just like, I know dental records, so go dig up that body. They still have teeth in there, right? I hope so, unless those were um, picked out and sold by his brother, too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Match some dental records up. Right. Before Dalton's death, Rudy and Lester petitioned the Franklin County Circuit Court to change Dalton's name back to Jesse James. With hat in hand, Dalton was carried into the courthouse on a stretcher. Judge Ransom A. Brewer, and that's because he's he's old as shit. Right. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Okay. He dismissed the whole thing as being a publicity stunt. He said, there is no evidence here to show that this gentleman, if he ever was Jesse James, has ever changed his name. If his name has never been changed from Jesse James, he is still Jesse James in name, and therefore, there is nothing that this court can do. 
<laughs> if he isn't what he professes to be, then he is trying to perpetuate a fraud upon this court. With that, Lester and Rudy returned to Miramac Caverns, and J. Frank Dalton remained a mysterious and grumpy man for the remainder of his life. He died on August 16, 1951, during a visit to Granbury, Texas. And if he really was Jesse James, he was 103 years, 11 months, and 10 days old. Going back to your digging up of the gravesite idea. Of course, there was some additional skeptics, so someone had to dig up the gravesite. <laughs> In 1995, Professor James E. Stars, who was a law professor, not a forensic scientist, from George Washington University, exhumed the body of Jesse James that was buried in Kearney, Missouri. Only one of two grave sites of James. Based on DNA comparisons with living members of the James family, it was ruled that the body in the grave was actually that of Jesse James. Not surprisingly, though, there was a lot of controversy about the findings, the quality of the evidence, and why distant relatives were used for the tests when Jesse's own mother, Zerelda, was buried like right next to him. Supporters of the J. Frank Dalton claim scoffed at the findings and swore to produce their own tests of Dalton's remains. And at this time, the death of Jesse James and the truth behind the tales of J. Frank Dalton remain a mystery. I don't have any results of Dalton's remains, so maybe we'll have a an update. Well, it did come to mind when he went to court to try to be like, I want to change my name. Why the fuck were those people in the court, within the court, they have the ability to search records. And right. that, they do that shit all day long. <laughs> exactly. Like it's part of their job ish, right? right? I realize the judge doesn't necessarily do that, but how much effort does it really take to take this man that's going by this name and search right. this name and find out, no, you were born in Pennsylvania. This is your mother and this is your father. You have a whole family. You're denying by saying that you're this other person. If he's not yeah, using you a he's... fake name, then right. that name is connected to some kind of record, I would right. think, that you could try to find where is his real family? Who is right. he really? Or is it just so easy to lie about who you are back then? I mean, and this was, we're talking the 50s, so I don't think it was that long ago. I feel like he went into the court and the court says, we don't have any proof that you've ever changed your name, sir. So either they're investigating Jesse James's records or they're investigating J. Frank Dalton's. It's really interesting to me that it was never said J. Frank Dalton, born of so and so mother, yeah. Dalton father. You know, it wasn't Where's it wasn't put out that way. Right, I mean, exactly. is it like if you were never arrested, and you don't have fingerprints on file, then oh, right. well, you can never get caught doing anything can, type situation. Yeah. I don't know. These are wild times <laughs> that you're talking about here. Because I'm just like, yeah. it just it doesn't seem like I can go out and just be a different person. Right. In this day and age no. with all the science that we have. So it's so strange to think how easy it might have been for somebody to just start calling themselves by a different name and then claim yeah. they're this person and stuff like that. And you're right about like, I was thinking they couldn't dig up the body and prove it's Jesse James because what DNA are they going to use? Right. But yeah, right. now they have the whole, even with those like kits and stuff that they're connecting yes. it from like distant relatives and everything. But right. you're right about the mom thing too. Why didn't they use right. that? Maybe they didn't have any legal course to justify digging up her body necessarily. And so the willing parties that would give their DNA to test yeah. is all that they can do. Or they're lazy or they're liars. <laughs> <laughs> all of those are very possible. All of them are, it's multiple choice and <laughs> all of them are winners. All, all of them's of them the correct winners. answer. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that the story was really interesting. The fact to me that the uh, the guys with the caves just like jumped onto the story so like they couldn't like they couldn't get enough. They're like, yes, Jesse James. And oh, we found the real guy. I mean, this this having him around gave them more fame than anything else. I mean, people really weren't, I don't know, running out to Miramac Caverns just to see the stalactites and the stalagmites. They wanted to know where the Jesse James gang had hid out. So, I mean, it brought to them what they were looking for, whether it was uh, really true or not. I guess that's really the mystery. The fact that they offered $10,000 to anyone that would come forward and prove them wrong and nobody ever did. That's also one of those things you have to say, well, I mean, who couldn't prove them wrong? 
the guy didn't have a family out there that's like, yep, that's the old crazy Frank. He's at it again. And go out there with the you know, certificate and be like, bring this old man home for like 19th time. You know? Yeah. You would think somebody. You would think somebody. But then there are stories of people that kind of just disappear. Yeah. Like no family. Nobody knows where they're at or nobody tries to find them. I right. you hear that on those unsolved mysteries all the time. All the time. <laughs> they exactly. Just, they poof, just go missing. And you never nobody's looking for them and nobody or like uh I've heard stories where you know, this, I was friends with this old person or whatever, <laughs> not even old, old people, you know, just so this silly. person and then they left money and then yeah. they couldn't find any relatives to give it to like, right. yeah, they pass away and then they cannot find right. a single family member to, uh, to give their belongings to, or even to contact. I've seen that I know. on like shows and stuff before too. Yeah. I've heard the commercial for that too. Uh, you <laughs> might be entitled to some money. Call us now. <laughs> I never thought about that. That's what those commercials about. I yeah, think I right. just remember like I watching Unsolved Mysteries. They've had cases like that and before yeah. and things like just on those kind of like almost a yeah. news programs. I don't know oh. if Unsolved Mysteries counts as a news program. <laughs> well, it did to it us back to in me. our day. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> My kind of news. <laughs> but yeah, nobody's looking for this person right. anymore and nobody is like... That's my uncle or whatever, you right. know, it's strange. I mean, unless he was just such a huge pain in the ass that there well, was kind of like, sound like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He does kind of seem that way. They were, Maybe his he family murdered was like, his whole, whole family. Oh, playing with those guns. But it's possible because he did seem a little trigger happy where he was just all like, fuck the reporters. Ksh, ksh, ksh. You know, he's shooting at anything. He might have just been like, fuck those kids. Ksh, ksh, ksh. Where's my dinner? Nobody's feeding me. I'm leaving this place. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's a it's a crazy story. Yeah. So does the museum still exist? The museum still exists. Yes. Is it where Miramac Caves is? Different counties. Okay. Because I've been there and I was a kid. So we did not go to this museum, I'm pretty sure. But the whole no. fog and noise. Oh, my God. That I know. I've never been to the museum either, but it seems like it would have been an amazing thing to tour. And, and um, I kind of want to go back just to go to the caves and do the whole nine yards. But um, before I get too excited about going back, in case you were wondering, the Miramac Caverns are haunted. I didn't just want to tell you that very interesting side story about the caves just because I love to talk. Um, <laughs> I have a story from a previous employee and guide, which is followed up by an extraordinary picture taken inside the caves as well. And here's the story. So every time I say I, it's actually dude or dudette. I'm not really sure uh, <laughs> who, because all I have is an R. So it could be Robert, um, Regina. I'm not sure. It's an R. <laughs> so <laughs> I worked at Miramac Caverns for a long time. I was a senior guide there. My job was to close the cave, and that meant going to the back of the jungle room to make sure all the lights were out on the tour route. Ask any of the guides there when you get them alone. They are forbidden by managers to say anything about the hauntings. And make sure you ask one of the younger second or third year guides, like you've really got to interview these people when you get there. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> How many years have you been? I've got to ask some questions. <laughs> Apparently, the second or third year guides will be more apt to tell you than any of the older ones. And ask either before or after the tour, as they are shadowed by senior guides on at least one tour a day, although they never know when. I, again, are, meaning I, have personally seen a woman in a wedding dress coming down the ramp by the pendulum and an Indian woman that stands in the water. I also had quite a few people on tours that would ask me why they weren't allowed to be off the path, but the man in the black over there was or would ask if I had lost someone from the group because they would see a man walking back to disappear beyond the bend in the jungle room. I mean, stories suggest that the man is actually Lester Dill, who developed the cave into the attraction it is now. He also haunts his former office that his son-in-law uses and where you have to go to put the money up at night in the vault. Of course he does. No. <laughs> What's so funny is as soon as you said that it's Lester in the cave, I said, nah, he's not fucking down there. He's wherever the money's at. Okay. And then that was the next thing out of your mouth. 
That's why you're like, boom, there it is. Boom. Knew he it. must have just went down there to check and make sure everybody was working. Right, right, right. That's what he's doing. Just having a peek. Okay, you're getting back to work. I'm Selling gonna go that story. The- make sure they see the Jesse James guns. Right. <laughs> Souvenirs all around. Make sure they buy them. <laughs> uh, the uh, story continues, and this person says that he's or she's almost been locked into the vault room more than once the door shuts and locks on its own and it is not one of those automatic locking doors and i took this picture when we were on tour of miramac caverns so let me send this to you now oh isn't that wild so who knows whose face that should be but it doesn't have a body (laughs) <laughs> no it is i mean you almost would think it has like shoulders but that's rock yeah, i'm pretty sure rock. but it it almost like it forms some sharp shoulders there and stuff and then i'm like he looks like a um alien or something like that's a harsh face it is a harsh face very high cheekbones and yeah looks like almost like he's got a beard like a long beard on yeah it's, um, it definitely because it cuts off there yeah, because so you, you don't get to see like the full part of his uh, yeah. jawline. It feels like almost because it's too short. Maybe it's not, but it just. I mean, his ghost. Maybe it's not for right. me. And so okay, <laughs> so it's a picture of a wall inside the cave. So it's a rock wall, we'll say, right. in a cave, just like brick or something like that. The lines on a tree, the lines on any kind of wood. Your eyes can matrix. Oh yeah. And you can see faces and shapes, but dark shadow here and there. It's happened to us and got us, and you got to really zoom in and keep looking. Yeah. This is different, though. I mean, it is really bright right there that outlines his forehead, his nose, and then the top of his lip. Right. And then you could even see, like, the indention, you know, that you have above your lip. Yeah. You know what I'm talking right. about? I don't know if that's called yeah. a thing or anything. He looks like he has Spock ears. That's just yeah, he does. That's why I think I said alien, but I meant Spock. And it's just a face. It's it is weird. Like Wendy said, it's 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 a bright face in a dark area, and it kind of reminds me of like one of the images that we caught at the James J. Eldridge house, where that thing was out there in the yard, and it's got like that glowy face to it. You can't see the face; it's whited out completely, but it seems to be brighter than everything else around it. You know. Mm-hmm. It's just got that glow to it yeah. that is unnatural. And, and it's obvious in the lower part of the picture, they have, there's light. So mm-hmm. in in a lot of these caves, there's always lights shining on this and that. You got to have yeah. light to walk through so it's not dark. And then it might be, you know, putting a spotlight onto something that the tour guide's going to point out. Look at this. Right rock right here this uh stalact whatever it looks like a rabbit or it's a hundred thousand years old look at how big it is whatever you know so i mean you could say there might be a light mounted there at the top but it would shoot across like the one on the bottom does and this one makes a circular face all of a sudden it's just not it's just not it's just weird and not right (laughs) yeah i mean unless Whoever owns the caves today is still trying to pull that uh, money-making scheme, and they've got some <laughs> kind of projector in there. I mean, and it's just shooting faces off at random times, but I don't know. I doubt it. Um, I think the picture's interesting, and I thought that I'd forward it to you. Of course, I'll put it out there on social media when this episode airs um, so that you can see what we're referring to. It, it's it's a weird picture, to say the least. It's. I think it's good. I mean... I would definitely put it out there for other people to look at. Yeah. If I was the one that took this, obviously. All these pictures that we share on social media, a lot of the times we get comments being like, well, I'm not there, so I don't know for True. sure. Yeah. yeah, we weren't there either. Right. And we don't 100% trust these photos either. Right. But it circulated enough without somebody disputing it that we thought yeah. we wanted to share it and get your opinion as well. And so yeah. this is one of those. I mean, I'm having a hard time figuring out like what else it could be. So I think it's a yeah. good one. All we're if doing I got is- that, I would be like super proud of myself. Right. That was actually caught February 23rd, 2008. Ooh. So it's an older picture. I mean, oh, I was not- going to say not too long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, we were just like back in the 50s. So just- yeah, right, 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 right. I jumped, I jumped way ahead. To, I mean, it could have been like a cell phone picture, you know, someone just taking pictures of the cave going along and, 
you know, they get like the best damn evidence. <laughs> like I bet that. it. Yeah, I bet it was a cell phone picture because a yeah. lot of the times they won't let you use flash inside the caves and stuff. Right. Right. Because it's going to harm the rocks that have been there for decades. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. That's just me being an ass. Um, so, yeah. Um, again, just to recap. The caves are haunted. The battlefield is haunted. The farm is haunted. Y'all just go to Missouri because, damn, I bet if I had the time to look into that wax museum, it probably would have turned out to be haunted, too. <laughs> it's, it's haunted enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> what is like it? I don't need to go. I'm sure it's haunted, haunted too. Haunted <laughs> with sad, fake eyeballs or Creepy whatever. <laughs> Dead staring at you. But... That was a super fun story for me to look into. Um, the legend of Jesse James and a conspiracy theory to boot. Not to mention, but I've been to the Merrimack Caverns myself. And Wendy <laughs> said earlier she was there too. So it was interesting to know that there is more to it than just some old drippy caves. And I'm not <laughs> And I'm not saying that the tour, the tour wasn't cool. But damn, if I knew then what I know now, then... I mean, I wouldn't have had my little accident. You know, that's how the story goes. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just love it. I um, I would love to go back there with a recorder and my IR camera, you know, just in case they are still on the whole no light, no flash photography in the cave situation and maybe see what we can get. I should go back real quick because you can't see us. So you don't know that Chris flashed her wrist to me when she said she <laughs> would have her little accident. That was a whole Beetlejuice reference Beetlejuice. there. <laughs> I'm just laughing at it. Ha, ha, ha. And then I'm like, I don't know if that will work well over just audio. <laughs> so. No, people already think we're weird enough. They're like, why are they still They're laughing? Like, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I loved that story. It was very exciting, you know, because it connects to some of the places that you kind of have been to, but not even for those reasons, like when we were younger or whatever, you know, we're just going there to see those damn stalactites and stuff. Right. <laughs> and then you happen to get a small little Jesse James story, but I didn't know it was this big. I never yeah. knew like this whole full detail and everything. It's that was really cool. And I didn't, I want to go to that museum Except for I'm scared. Um. <laughs> I'll go with you. And we'll like breeze past the wax figures because I don't want to see that shit either. I just want to see the autopsy photos and the guns and stuff right, like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you remember when we, it was the witch dungeon? Dungeon museum. Yeah. Yes. And at the yes. end, there's like a wax figure and I had to hide behind you so that we could get out the door. <laughs> <laughs> but you did so good at the birdcage. There's like wax figures all over the place. There's like, oh yeah, there is. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was like, there's one. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go up the stairs, isn't there one like right there when you go up the stairs from the yeah, basement? Yeah, I remember. You were so proud of me for going up the stairs by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, she doesn't have a fear. She's been lying to me this whole time. I was totally not looking at that thing. <laughs> 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 like racing by it like head down it's so oh, weird man. it's a phobia though i looked it up yeah. i figured yeah, no, it out I, it's not just me no it's not <laughs> it's like people have I, they have a fear of clowns i have a fear of spiders so i mean if it was a spider in that museum i'd be hiding behind <laughs> you <laughs> you'd be like beating at me like chris get away from me go kill it nope <laughs> can't deal with this it has like thousands of eyes but anyways if you happen to have any stories from Missouri or of the James legend and you would like to share them, uh, you've been to the Merrimack Caverns and seen any dark figures looming in the shadows and you want to share those too, write to us at creaturesofthenightparanormal at gmail.com. We would love, love, listen to me, love to add your stories. <laughs> so what we have is a creature feature, but you got to write to us first. Boom. You like that? I just Boom. threw that in there. I, I do. I like that. <laughs> also, if you have a juicy enough story that you share with us on any location or another location in Missouri, I'm just putting this out there because I get recommendations. Oh, you should do this. Have you done this story? How about if you've been there and you've had an awesome experience, write us and tell us, and then we'll dig up the history of the place. We'll tell everybody the history of the place, and then we'll share your experience. It'll be a part of our podcast story. So right. If you got a juicy place that you said, this is the most haunted place I've ever been to. Like, <laughs> if you're a paranormal investigator like ourselves, then share it with us, and we'll make a big deal about it. We'll do a whole podcast on it. 
Right. Just like I did with this man's story, how I, or, or gal's story. Again, I don't know, but I did, I had to do this whole story based on this one picture that I found on the Merrimack caves. And as <laughs> I kept digging and kept digging, I kept finding more. So that's all you got to do is just write to us and give us your information. Yeah. Make it what, easy for us. Tell us what to, to tell stories about. <laughs> 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 don't leave it up to us. Yeah. Right. And don't forget to check us out on social media. It's COTN underscore paranormal on Instagram and COTN paranormal on the Facebook and the Twitter. (laughs) We will be, (laughs) I just like saying, look, my cat was staring at me uh, this morning. (laughs) I'm like, get out of here, cat. I'm tweeting. I'm tweeting. (laughs) (laughs) I'm having an argument with my cat. She's just staring at me like, well, can I just have some food? Like, no, I'm tweeting. (laughs) But We will add all sorts of goodies to go along uh, with the podcast during the week of its release. And all we ask of you to do is just all the typical social media things like, you know, liking, commenting, sharing, caring, all of those good things. (laughs) I was trying to think of what the Care Bear said, but mm, that's it. (laughs) My dementia, I I can't remember it. Oh, no. (laughs) But it's Um, something like that. Yeah, it was something like that. I don't yeah. remember their song either. Well, that was and a good as- story. Thank you very much. Sorry I cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at that. I just wanted to tell you thank you one more time. <laughs> cool. Look, I was so, so sure that you were doing this story because I'm like, Isn't this, is, this so is right weird. up Wendy's alley. This is oh, so Wendy's I wrote John- two, I wrote two stories because I'm afraid <laughs> she's going to do my story. And this is not at all anything like my stories. <laughs> So our psychic connection was not on this week. <laughs> That's so funny because it's usually like right on. Like I was, I thought for sure you were either going to do something Jesse James related or caves. I just knew it. I'm like, <laughs> oh. So as always, please subscribe to the show because it means so much to us that you continue to come back each week for more shows. And that's all I got for you. Happy 50th. Happy 50th. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys.